Hey, have you guys played the new XCOM game? Pretty fun, right? Well, it kind of got us into a sci-fi mood, so just for kicks, we'd like to tackle the burning question. Should we be funding XCOM? Like, a real XCOM. If you played it, you may have noticed how, at the very beginning of the game, the XCOM project already exists. It's clearly in place before any aliens show up on Earth and start wrecking us. And that got us to thinking, is that reasonable? Should we be funding an actual XCOM right now? I mean, we saw how well things worked out for Egypt when they stopped funding my XCOM project. Alien Hurricane. So today and next week, we're going to see if we can answer that question in something approaching a rational manner, with some extra help from our good friend, Scott DeWitt. In this episode, we're going to talk about two fundamental pieces of reasoning when addressing the question of extraterrestrial intelligence, the Drake Equation and the Fermi Paradox. The Drake Equation deals with the likelihood of intelligent extraterrestrial life existing within our galaxy. The Fermi Paradox deals with the likelihood of that intelligence ever having come to visit. So let's start today with the Drake Equation. In 1961, astrophysicist Frank Drake, the man who founded SETI, laid out a logical formula for estimating the number of existing intelligent civilizations that we might be able to communicate with within our galaxy. His formula goes like this. The number of intelligent civilizations equals the average rate of star formation in the galaxy times the fraction of stars that have planets times the average number of planets per star that has planets that can potentially support life times the percentage of those planets that actually develop life times the percentage of planets with life that develop intelligent life, times the fraction of intelligent life that produces technology capable of detection across space, times the length of time that those civilizations continue to release signals detectable across space. So, big equation. Let's talk about those parts a bit and plug in some numbers. First, let's talk about the average rate of star formation in the galaxy. It might seem weird to talk about the rate of star formation rather than the total number of stars in the galaxy, but that's the way it's phrased just because that means the rest of the equation, except for that very last bit, will give us the number of new civilizations being born each year. And if you simply multiply that by the length of time that those civilizations keep transmitting signals, that will give you the number of active civilizations at any given time. Okay, so how many stars are forming each year? Well, the latest NASA and ESA estimates put us at about seven, so let's run with that number. Next, what fraction of stars have planets? There's data to suggest that nearly every solar system has planets, but our current experimental techniques can only verify large planets, or planets close to their stars. Because, amongst other things, we detect planets by looking for stars dimming a little when planets pass in front of them. And that's much easier to see with big planets than small ones. For our purposes, let's take a pessimistic view and go with something close to our current estimate via planets we can actually verify. So we'll assume 40% of stars have planets. Alright, so what percentage of those stars have habitable planets? This estimate's going to be a bit of a shot in the dark, as we've yet to find a habitable exoplanet. One of the possible flaws for most of the estimates for habitable planets out there is that they assume that to support life you need an Earth-like planet, one that sits in the habitable zone of a star, is roughly Earth-sized, big enough to support an atmosphere at temperatures in the habitable zone, but small enough that it doesn't accumulate gases and become a gas or ice giant, perhaps even requiring outer gas giants to shield it from meteors, active tectonics to mix things up, not being tidal-locked, maybe even having a large moon to create a level of tidal activity that we have on Earth. Anyway, I believe that we'll end up finding life on planets that don't look so absolutely similar to ours, but that's just me. And there are certainly people who believe our planet is practically unique in all of the universe in terms of the criterion required for life. So for this exercise, let's just go with some Earth-like planet estimates I saw from NASA and say that this number should be roughly 5.4%. Next question. How many of those habitable planets end up with life on them? I'm going to take a somewhat optimistic view here and go with 100%. This is often the estimate used in the Drake Equation, due to the relative rapidity of life occurring on Earth once meteors stop slamming into us every two seconds. Next, how many life-bearing planets go on to develop intelligent life? We have evolutionary evidence, both in our current biosphere and with certain dinosaurs, to suggest that intelligence, or at least a high encephalization quotient, is something that multiple species trend towards. I'm going to put this at 50%, assuming that intelligence is fairly likely to be selected for evolutionarily, but that all sorts of disasters might happen before life reaches that point. Now we have to ask, how many planets that evolve intelligent life manage to reach a level of technology where they can be detectable through space? Oh, and detectable through space just means giving off artificial electromagnetic radiation. So if you can get to radio, you're detectable through space. I'm going to put this at 90%. Technology just gives so much benefit to a species from an evolutionary perspective. I think that sooner or later, all intelligent species inevitably get there, barring some major disaster. Finally, we have to ask the scary question. How long do these civilizations remain detectable? This is sort of like asking how long before a highly technological civilization wipes itself out, and in fact that's often how it's phrased. But I like to consider the alternative fact, that we may come up with other forms of communication that don't involve as much electromagnetic radiation. In fact, the amount of waves that we've been bleeding into space as a species has declined a great deal over the last 30 years alone, as we've moved away from doing things like broadcasting TV inefficiently over the air. And since humanity's the only case study we got, and we've lasted with radio at least 110 years, let's take that as our minimum bound. 
So, plug all of those numbers into the equation, and it gives us a result of about 7.5 civilizations communicating in our entire galaxy. Now, that doesn't sound like much. In fact, given the vastness of our galaxy, that means that the nearest communicating civilization is probably about 18,000 light years away. Or figure 36,000 years to get a radio message there and get a reply. Kind of jarring when put next to our estimate of the lifetime of a technological society. Of course, as you can see, the Drake Equation is merely an estimating tool. We had to make a lot of guesses back there, and if you plugged in radically different numbers, you'd get radically different results. In fact, I encourage you to try it. But for right now, let's just take this number of 7.5 civilizations in the galaxy. Now, a moment ago, I estimated that the nearest communicating civilization is probably about 18,000 light years away, but there's a big problem with that estimate. Can you guess what? Yep, that estimate assumes that the civilization only occupies one solar system, that they haven't gone out and colonized the vast reaches of space. But still, a radius of 18,000 light years per civilization seems like a lot. Maybe they've colonized their corner and we just haven't noticed. Or perhaps there's something more going on here. We will talk about that next time with the Fermi Paradox. See you then.